All right, we are continuing our series, uh, our Advent series called Among Us. We're talking about the significance of the incarnation or God becoming flesh, the hope of God becoming a baby is what we're talking about. We've been walking through the Gospel of John. And uh, so if you have Bibles, you can open up to John chapter 1. We're kind of doing a little rewind a little bit. I'm going to read some verses uh, from ver- uh, 19 to 23, and we'll skip to the end of the chapter uh, after that. And then I'll tell you why during the teaching, why we're doing that. So let's... Uh, Read from John chapter 1, starting in verse 19. I'll be reading for the NIV. And John says, Now this was John's testimony, that's John the Baptist, uh, when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, Then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Finally they said, Well, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. And then we'll skip down to verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, in whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked, Come and see, said Philip. And when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Well, how do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Let's pray together. God, I ask in this time, as always, that my words would be your words. Lord, that uh, through your Holy Spirit, you would speak to each of us individually in a unique and fresh way, and God, that you'd also speak us, uh, speak to us corporately through your Holy Spirit as well of how you want us to live out this good news seven days a week, the news uh, of your arrival and what that means for our, our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. I might have mentioned this uh, sometimes in the past. Uh, does anybody love science fiction at all Anyone in here? Okay, I've got like four of you. Great. That's what's going to speak to four of you today. Um, so, well, maybe there's more at home. All, all the people that love sci-fi are at home as well. So, uh, no, I love science fiction. I'm a huge fan of it. And it's funny because my, uh, my wife was never really a fan of science fiction at all. And, and then she met me, and now it's kind of like our thing. We, she loves science fiction as well, so I'm glad I, I found a convert. But... Um, you know, you imagine what the future's like, you, the advancement of technology, and just the, it's, it's a lot of imagination, if you will. It impacts the way, we, how it impacts the way we live. I just love that stuff. Um, exploring, like, unknown parts of our universe, and, and, and there's ways to do that. There's all sorts of cool stuff with sci-fi that happens. I'd say if I had to, you know, someone, I mean, I've watched a lot of sci-fi shows and films. I'd say one of my f- more favorite, say, sci-fi films would be Interstellar. It came out like about eight years ago. It's uh, with Matthew McConaughey. And uh, it, it's really a mind-bending uh, a film. I might have mentioned this before, but uh, basically Earth is kind of like not doing too swell, and they're trying to find a, a habitable pl- planet to, for, for Earth to live on. And this is, I, we don't know when it's set. It's probably set like 40 or something years in the future, at least the movie is. And uh, they send this team, they find a wormhole, which is, enables them to travel really fast through to another galaxy. And uh, they end up finding this black hole, a uh, huge black hole. And this guy, Matthew McConaughey's character, actually goes through the black hole. And no one, no one, no scientist of this day has no idea what happens on the other side of a black hole. We just know it's really bad uh, going into it. It does all sorts of things. And they've been trying to figure out that for, for tons and tons of time. And so Interstellar like takes a takes a stab at like what that looks like. And when I'm not going to spoil the movie too much if you haven't watched it yet, but when he goes to the black hole, he's he makes it. But it's all it's all speculation, imagination. But it really messes with uh, with all sorts of things about about time and space. 
Um, and I won't spoil about what happens because it's really cool. It's also a very like heartfelt kind of connection type movie, like human connection type movie. They kind of run both of those things at the same time, but um, it really blows your mind. And it's all based on all sorts of scientific theories. I mean, they're basically putting scientific theories together and speculating what might happen on the other side of this black hole. Now, why? I'm not going to talk sci-fi all day, okay? But I do mention that because I think uh, compared to us, and compared to the Jewish people of the first century, that's kind of like what this text is like today. It's, I'm, I'm calling the teaching Jesus a space odyssey. That's what I'm going to call it today. Because uh, we're going to talk about space. Not outer space, but sacred space. Because the, the way that we understand sacred space and space is a lot different than the first century Jewish people did. And it really matters in the sense of the text that are talking about and what John is trying to do with his gospel at the beginning here. Uh, and it's pretty amazing, uh, the implications of it and, 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 and what happens for, for our lives today. So, again, as I always ask, bear with me, because we're going to go through some stuff like culturally and those kinds of things to kind of unpack what this means. Um, if you remember, uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about John the Baptist uh, in this series. And, and w- at this point in the story, the religious leaders are confronting Ju- John the Baptist about his identity. They're trying to figure out who he is. He's been baptizing people. We talked about John baptizing people into a national identity, like a movement, of, uh, if you will, of basically kind of like a, a new kind of Israel, uh, a revolutionary Israel. And people were signing up. He was very popular. But these religious leaders like, eh, they're always skeptical which there's nothing wrong with a healthy dose of, of skepticism and cynicism about some things, but in questions. But they're asking him who he was. Now, all these questions that they're asking him that we read in the text are all things about the coming Messiah. Because, see, the, the Jewish people had signposts of how they would know that the Messiah is coming. And they've been waiting for a long time for this to happen. And so they have signposts. And one of those signposts is that someone like Elijah the prophet is going to come which is why they ask him if he's Elijah. He's like, no, I'm not Elijah. Okay, well, the cross is that off. Well, are you the prophet? Are you like the dude that's going to, nope, I'm not him either. Well, who in the world are you? They're trying to figure this out because like, you're baptizing all these people. These people are following you. We're trying to figure out who you are. And then he quotes something from Isaiah, chapter 40. He says that he's a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. It's chapter 40 of Isaiah. Now, That's an interesting part of the text because in Isaiah chapter 40, it's talking about the future of Israel and specifically the temple. And what it assumes in chapter 40 (laughs) is that God is going to arrive in the temple and that this is something you should look forward to. That also makes another assumption that God isn't in the temple right now, which probably isn't words that they want to hear, right? But that's what he's quoting. He said, that's who I'm talking about that's coming. He's talking about the Messiah that's coming, but it's kind of like a, a backhanded compliment or insult, if you will. I don't know which one it is, but it's not necessarily the prettiest uh, in the world either. But the, here's, the, here's the other issue with this, as he's talking about the temple. See, the temple is still around the time of this writing. The temple doesn't get destroyed until the year 70, like totally raised to the ground by the Romans. But the temple's still around. And so for John to say that God hasn't arrived in the temple can be very confusing. Because he's like, well, wait, the temple's here, and God's in the temple, so therefore, how can you say God hasn't arrived in the temple? What are you trying to say? So now we're going to fast forward to Philip and Nathan. And it's this is an odd text to throw in here. Basically, like we, we get the whole idea of Jesus being like, way back at creation, being the agent of creation. That's where John starts the Christmas story. He brings it all the way up to the present. The word becomes flesh. We talked about that. He tabernacled among us. We talked about what tabernacle meant. That was like the moving temple, right, where God's presence resided. So you got that imagery. So you already know that John, uh, the gospel writer, is very much into temple imagery. He's, he's very much trying to talk about God's presence and, and where that is, and especially in relationship to the temple. So now we're at Philip and Nathan at the end of the chapter. And Philip Philip tells Nathaniel, hey, I found the Messiah, the the one we've been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And Nathaniel doesn't really believe him. And he even kind of says, well, what good can come from Nazareth? This is a whole other teaching, but pretty funny. Like, really? Nazareth? That's kind of a 
run-down place. There's not really any good people from there. It's not a really great place. Well, Philip's just like, well, just come and see you for yourself then. If you're going to be a little skeptical, and just fine, come on. So he comes along, and then there's this kind of odd incident where Jesus kind of pronounces like a, a claim on him. Hey, there's Nathaniel, one with no deceit. Like, how do you... He's just, you don't know me. Like, how do you know who I am? And then Jesus says, well, before, when, when basically Philip went up to you, you were under a fig tree, which he wouldn't have known because they've never met. So how does he know that? Well, that's what wigged Nathaniel out to the point of, hey, the only person that could do something like that is the Messiah, hence why he says, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. So he's claiming already, yep, you're the dude. So pretty, pretty, pretty amazing stuff that this guy's doing. Nathaniel's pretty amazed. But then what happens after that at the end of the text is the really interesting part. Because Jesus says this, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. And then he added, very truly I tell you, it's like pay attention. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What in the world is that all about? Why would Jesus say that? Like, how does that make any sense in anything with John or what he's talking about with Nathaniel and Philip? Well, when, you see, when, when a Jewish person would see the phrase, the angels of God descending and, uh, ascending and descending, there is one story they're very familiar with that they would think of right away. And in fact, we've been talking about it in Torah Club for the last two or three weeks because we're in that part of the Bible. It's in Genesis about Jacob's ladder, a dream that Jacob has. And, when you, and, and in, in, the, in the dream, Jacob, I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Jacob. Jacob kind of is the dude that uh, he, was, he, had, he had a brother named Esau. He was like hanging on to his heel when he was born, and they're kind of like always at each other. He kind of tricked him or deceived him out of the birthright and blessing which we talked about that in Torah Club, which is really fascinating because I think Jacob gets a, a pretty bad rap sometimes for that, but he not totally off the hook. But, of course, when he takes these two things from Esau, Esau gets a little upset. Jacob runs away. As he's running away, he has his dream about a ladder that's reaching from the ground up to heaven. And he sees, like, angels descending and ascending from the ladder to talk about kind of God's presence and why, uh, you know, it's really the question that, that gets asked a lot. And what Jacob really, he didn't really think that God was around until that dream. When he had the dream, he realized God was a lot closer than he thought. In fact, he woke up from the dream after seeing this whole thing. And he said, God was in this place all along, and I am now just realizing it. That God's presence was right there with him. Not some far off distant place like all the other gods, but right there close to him, even in the midst of this tension of him running away from his brother who probably might be trying to kill him. So what in the world does that have to do with Philip and Nathaniel in John chapter 1? Well, the idea of where is God's presence is a major question that people are asking all the time. Where is God? I mean, that's a question people still ask, isn't it? Where is God's presence? How do you know he's around? And what's interesting is the tabernacle, like we talked about when, when it said the word became flesh or tabernacle among us, the tabernacle was the mobile structure that the Israelites had in the Exodus when they left Egypt from slavery where God's presence literally resided. Later on, they built a more permanent structure, the temple, Solomon built that, and God's presence permanently resided there. And what's interesting is that understanding what the temple is, even the tabernacle and God's presence, is where it becomes a little space odyssey for us. Because the way that we understand space and the way that Jewish people understand space are much different. And here's the thing about space. The temple, literally, for the Jewish people, is the space where heaven and earth came together. So if, if you know what a Venn diagram is? You know, they had like two circles. Like if you said heaven was one circle and, and earth is another circle and you kind of start to mesh them together a little bit and they intersect, there's that intersection part. You've seen that before? Where it intersects, where they have a common place, where they overlap, 
that space would be the temple. That is what they literally believed about the temple. That, that's why it was a sacred space, because heaven and earth literally were the, met there. God's presence and human presence literally met at the temple. And that's important to understand, because that changes everything about John chapter 1 and what John is trying to do with the text and to talk about Jesus and why this is significant. So if the temple is the space where heaven and earth met, heaven is not only close, but it's near. See, Westerners, we're, we're really bad about, we, we kind of take it from the Greeks where we think heaven's a place somewhere else in another space somewhere we float away to. Even when we think about Jacob's Ladder, it's like reaching up to heaven, like it's this faraway place, but it's not. It's, you know, N.T. Wright like describe it like a veil, like it's a curtain, like right in front of us. Well, that would be true of the temple, except it's like intersecting. In fact, I mean, there is a place where God's presence is literally residing, and only, there's not many people that can go in there, or they would die. So it's a very sacred space, this temple. So that's why they took it seriously. It is everything to the Jewish people. That's why the temple is vital. It's central. to. They believe the temple is the center of the world, is what the Jewish people believe. So... Back to John, when you got John the Baptist saying, well, God hasn't arrived in the temple. They're like, wait a minute. We have the temple. God's here. Heaven and earth is meeting right here. What are you talking about? I mean, what they believed about the temple is also that the temple isn't just you know, where God resided and heaven and earth meet. It points to a, a reality in the future where that Venn diagram is going to become, instead of like an intersection, it's going to become like one, which is, which is the image in Revelation, where heaven and earth will become one. That's what happens at the end of the story. That's what they believe. And John is basically saying, oh, by the way, yeah, God's not here. He's somewhere else. Some, some, something else is coming. It's really confusing to the religious leaders. And what's crazy about the incarnation is that the Jewish people already had a symbol of that. That's the temple, right? Heaven and earth meet at the temple. But here's the problem. And I think John would probably point this out. The temple was corrupt. By this time, see, here's the thing about the temple. Like, like our church, it's, not, it's not the same as like our church. We can't, we can't compare the two because the temple was also the bank. Like, literally, the banking system for the Jewish people is the temple. So they controlled the banking. The, all the economic practices that happened went through the temple. So, imagine if you owed a debt to somebody, your debt records are kept where? In the temple. And guess who controls the temple? Chief priests, religious leaders, right? So if you owe debts to someone and someone who's a chief priest or religious leader decided to, I don't know, maybe exploit you a little bit, that's a problem. And it's kind of conflicting because the temple is sacred space. It's God's space where heaven and earth meet. And now you have this image that heaven and earth, together, heaven, is about exploiting people. Well, that's a problem, right? And that was the time that we're talking about right now. So the, the Jewish people's view of the temple, a lot of them, like ordinary people, is not very good. And you're going to talk about this being sacred space, and John is kind of pushing back a little bit on that. And what would be interesting is that when they would have a revolt, there would be, there'd be rebels who would revolt against the temple. They would try to invade the temple. You know what they would try to do when they raided the temple? They would go and try to burn all the debt records that were inside the temple. Because the temple was more than just a place of worship. It was the bank. And if I burn the debt record, then I don't have the debt. The temple can't hold that over me. And they can't take advantage of me. I mean, this is kind of the reality of what they're living in at the time. And now, this temple has become a symbol, not of the incarnation of God, but of oppression and violence and so now you enter Jesus into the picture. And what John is saying is like, look, the temple is no longer in the building. In fact, what Jesus is saying 
by quoting Jacob's ladder, is saying, the temple is now among you. He's arrived in a person. It's living and breathing in the temple, and it's living and breathing in him. He is the temple because the temple is where God's presence is. And God's presence is definitely in Jesus. Heaven and earth meet together, and you're looking at him in the flesh. I mean, can you ma- imagine how mind-blowing this is to people? Like, wait a minute. Because, I mean, all your life and for generations upon generations, the temple was always a building. It's always a structure. It's where sacred space is, and now that sacred space is a person. Like, that doesn't make any sense. But that's what's happening. And now the temple, instead of just being the static structure that's also marred by corruption, is now living and breathing and interacting with people. And we'll talk about why that means uh, a lot in a moment. What's interesting is that in the Bible, when you, when you hear the word heaven mentioned, you know, a lot of times, actually the Gospel of Matthew is a great example of this, because people, you know, they think like sometimes heaven uh, means like that other place somewhere else. In the Gospel of Matthew, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, you'll notice in the Gospel of Matthew, he never says kingdom of God in, in Matthew. Matthew never mentions kingdom of God. You know what he says? He says kingdom of heaven. And people always thought that meant two different things. Except for most Jewish people, when you said the word heaven, that's interchangeable with saying God. So when I said kingdom of heaven, it's kingdom of God. It's the same thing. So imagine about the temple and sacred space when heaven and earth meet. Maybe you could say it's when God and earth come together. Which has been something that has been the story of the Bible all throughout. See, a lot of, I mean, this is why I think it's so destructive when we talk about any sort of, well, I'll use the term theology, the way we think about God, any type of theology that has the idea of us going away to somewhere else or trying to escape this place to go to God is completely not reading the Bible. Because the Bible is constantly talking about God coming here. God wanting to come here. And if you think about Jacob's dream, right? The ladder rising to heaven, angels descending and ascending, and what's happening with Jesus, Jacob didn't have to climb the ladder to get to God. What did God do in the Gospel of John? He came down, right? As a human baby, the word became flesh. The word became a tabernacle where the presence of God in, we talked about in all of God's fullness that no one had ever seen is right there in front of you. God's presence have arrived. Sacred space is now sitting in front of you in a person. And I wish we could talk about like time and matter as well. That's a whole other sermon, but I'll just give you a teaser about time because time is also, I, I should call it a time and space odyssey, but I don't want to take like 55 minutes. But if I said a time odyssey, that's what the, the, you want the Jewish people to believe about the Sabbath? Think about, what the temp, think about what space was. Sacred spaces where heaven and earth came together, right? Space. Time for a Jew, that's what Sabbath was for. The Sabbath day was not about just God resting from creation. The Sabbath day was about time, a statement about time, where God's time and human's time met together. So it's an intersection of God's time and human time. And that's why it's sacred. Anyway, that's another sermon for another time. But you see how, that, I mean, this is really like mind-blowing stuff to, to the Jewish people who are, who are witnessing this. All this stuff is, is now contained in a person. God in the flesh. Jesus, the temple, is now living and breathing. People just couldn't explain what was happening. I mean, the material world changed too, right? I mean, Jesus was healing people. He was casting out demons. He was doing things that seemed impossible in the material realm, right? Like physical ailments are just being eliminated. Like who does that kind of stuff? You think it's like magic, but no, that is God being in charge over the materials, material space. God, God is in charge of time. God is in charge of space. God is in charge of all of matter. He's in charge of it all, and now it's, it's sitting in a person in Jesus I think a lot of times, and here's where, here's where it matters to us. 
some of us like to describe God like Jacob's ladder. Because I think, I mean, the way that I talk to some people, it feels like it feels like there's so many hoops to jump through to get to God, right? Like, we may not say it that way because it sounds kind of harsh to say it that way, but sometimes we have these unwritten hoops that we want people to jump through to be genuinely going after God. We're like, okay, you, you can be really dedicated to God or going if you come to church or if you, you know, you fill in the blank with whatever you want. And we have all these hoops that seem that we put on all the time about accessing God and seeing God. And, and what's interesting is that the story of the Bible seems to be incessant about God coming to us, being proactive and coming to us all the time, like that's all he ever does. Why would we think it would be any different for how we show that to other people? Because, man, I tell you, a lot of the times people want to ask the question, how do I get to heaven? And I, I just want to let you know something. The Bible really never asks that question. You know what question the Bible asks? And you know what it's saying in Jacob's Ladder and what, with Jesus and John? The question is, how do I get heaven here? That's the question you should be asking. That's the question Jesus is asking in his Lord's Prayer. That's what he's praying for, right? He doesn't pray for us to go away to heaven, right? You remember the Lord's Prayer? Your kingdom come, you will be done, so we can go to heaven when we die, something like that, right? No, no, it doesn't say that, right? On earth as it is in heaven, he's praying for heaven to come here. Because they already have an understanding of that. Heaven has come, has met earth in the temple. Now the temple's Jesus. And we're praying more of that Venn diagram to come together. That's where, that's where we're at now. The time we're at now is between when Jesus has arrived as a temple and the full restoration of when heaven and earth come together. That's Revelation. And we are living this in between. And what we're doing, and then there's a call to us. Because guess what? This is what's really mind-blowing. Because the temple's Jesus God's fullness is in this person. Heaven's meeting earth in this person. This sacred space is here. Jesus is the temple, but you know what happens later in the Bible? Guess who becomes the temple in the rest of the New Testament? Do you know who it is? It's the church. That's right. Whew. Yeah, it's, it's a verse that gets misused a lot. But you know, in Corinthians, it talks about um, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't forget your body. And the funny thing is, your body is plural. <laughs> so instead of singular, we talked about that a series one time about y'all, right? A lot, of the, a lot of the yous in the Bible are plural. Your body, the church, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you think that's accidental language? I mean, this is really scary to me. I don't know, if, I don't know what you're thinking. So what the New Testament writers are asserting is that we are supposed to be <laughs> the intersection of heaven and earth meeting together and to put that on display. Whew, I don't know, man. Because you know sometimes the temple can be corrupt, right? Just like it was back then. It can be. But Jesus has already announced its arrival and for some odd reason, he is adamant on us continuing putting God on display in the flesh to the world. I mean, this, I mean, for anybody who is a first century Jewish person, they don't really, I mean, even the disciples don't understand this stuff until later on. So don't, you know, don't feel bad if it's kind of like bending your brain a little bit. But this is, this is what's happening. It's a, it's a total shift from how they understood everything about space and time and the material world. And it's, it's saying, you know, instead of the temple being in this building, now you are the temple where the reality of heaven and earth can intersect. And so this week, when we're approaching, celebrating the birth of heaven and earth coming together, that's what we're celebrating on Christmas, of God becoming flesh, there's going to be many opportunities for us to participate in that sliver of the intersection of heaven and earth. You know this happens all the time, by the way. We participate in this all the time. Let me give you an example. I didn't ask for permission, so I'm not going to name names. But there's a story, someone from this church, not too long ago, who told me 
that they were just out and about in a store, and there was a store manager who was unpacking Christmas inventory. It was This was back in November when Chris, all the Christmas stuff was coming out, or be, maybe at the end of October after Halloween just ended, right? And you kind of know that, like most stores, they're all short-staffed, right? I mean, a lot of people are looking for, you know, and a lot of retail people are looking for any employee that wants to work there. And so the people that are there are overworked, especially those who are managers, right? They're just, like, overwhelmed. And when you're in a place like that, it's just, it can get really bad. So this person's unpacking, and the person from our church can see that they're visibly looking distraught, just, like, overwhelmed by doing this. It probably, you probably think, I mean, I'm sure this person's going to be there way after they're supposed to, unpacking this inventory, trying to get on the shelves, and just doesn't have enough help and can't hire anyone. And this, per, this person felt a prompting, like, I think I need to, like, talk to her. And so many times before, she was telling me, like, you know, I, I felt this prompting in the past, but I never acted on it all the time. But this time I just decided to do it. And so she walked up and said, are, are you Okay. And she goes on to tell just what's going on in her life and just the overwhelming you know, nature of her job. And as she continues on, just feels more prompting, and especially this, because this was like, and for someone like her, this is a really bold move for someone like her. At the end of the whole conversation, she looks at her and says, can I give you a hug? And she just like, kind of taking a back, like, yeah. And so she gives her this big hug. And I don't know what the exact words were, but I, but it was something like, thank you for helping me to be seen. And what's interesting about that is we want, you know, all this talk about the temple and sacred space and the space odyssey and all this stuff. It can be mind-blowing for a lot of people. But if you think about that moment, that is actually what is happening with the temple coming to us. The temple isn't something that is a structure that you're inviting people to, and they have to go through a bunch of rituals to get admitted. Or they don't have to follow a bunch of rules of what people put down. No, the temple is living and breathing in the hearts of people of God's people, the church. And that temple is proactive. That temple was going out. That temple was reaching out. And, and for us, it taps into a lot of our mission, right? Living the good news of Jesus seven days a week. And many times we want to think that that is not, you know, it's all these big things all the time. And I don't know what's happened, and maybe she doesn't even know what's happened since then. But at that moment, that person said, I felt seen which tells me someone cared about me. And do you know what? That is the message that God continually tells the world, isn't it? And guess how he's going to communicate that? Through sacred space, the temple. And that temple is the church. And it started with Jesus. And friends, man, Think about this Christmas time, this next week. You're going to, I mean, I'm telling you, and I, I'm praying that you ask God to open your hearts and your eyes this week because you will see tons and tons of opportunities to be the temple to people. And the question is, will you answer the prompt? Because it happens all the time. The Holy Spirit does that. And you may not think it's a big deal, Friends, that was someone who sat and listened to someone's story and gave them a hug. That's it. It didn't seem like that big of a deal, but to that person, that was the world. They, someone finally cared about them, and that is how God feels about all of us. And of course, he wants that message to go out. That's what's so amazing about the incarnation, friends. God shows up right now in front of us, and right in front of us is the intersection of heaven and earth. When people get a taste of that, they're like, man, that is way beyond anything I ever imagined. It, it's like something's right with the world. That's exactly what's happening. That's what God wants. So how will you show up this week?
to be God's temple. Because God's temple came down here. And we're going to celebrate that come Christmas Eve again and again and again. What are those opportunities among you this week to what we say live to live the good news? The good news is that God cares about you. That God loves you, period. That he is constantly pursuing you. That he is near. That he is not distant. That's part of the good news, right? There's forgiveness for all the wrongdoings in your life. You, God can wipe the slate clean. You can have a new life. You can start on new ground, which is a great name for a church. I can't get past that. All right? Like, you could show that this week through little moments of just being the extension of sacred space, the temple where heaven and earth come together to extend the presence of Christ, even as simple as giving a hug. Let's pray. God, I ask that we continue. Well, I'll say this. God, that you show us and continue to show us the opportunity. And God, I pray that you would just bug us through your Holy Spirit. Keep poking at us until we finally get it through our thick skulls of what you're trying to say to us. And all these little moments to show uh, everybody, especially this week, what good news is. And God, we, just give us the right words to say, or even not any words, maybe the, the right ears to listen. The right ways to show love and care and compassion. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together as we hear this word of benediction, this good word. May you remember that heaven has come to earth and that a little bit of heaven can be extended through all of us as we extend the presence of Christ to the world. So may you take advantage of every opportunity to show good news seven days a week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and everybody said,